Graciela Casillas, thank you very much for coming out to theboxingbar.com and welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Graciela, first of all, were you born here in Ventura County or, you know, where were you born? Actually, I was born in um, in Bellflower and lived in Norwalk for the first probably decade of my life. And then at the age of 10, I moved to um, Oxnard with my family. I pretty much was raised here in Oxnard, went to elementary school here, um, junior high school and uh, high school. And what was it like growing up here in Oxnard for you? Well, it was a lot different than it is now. Um, a lot less people. Um, it was nice. Um, I attended all the local schools, and um, there wasn't a lot to do for young people at the time, so most of us went to church or participated in church groups, and that's what I was doing um, when I got introduced to the martial arts. Were your family, were they pretty religious? I wouldn't say they were very religious, but they were very strict, and both of my parents came from Mexico, and um, I grew up with eight brothers and two sisters, so it was a big family. And um, so the young ladies in the household did not get to do a, a whole lot. So one of the things we did was, you know, I belonged to one of those church groups, like um, a youth group. But my mom went to the church in the Colonia because it was offered in, in Spanish and she was Catholic. So um, I would say they're very spiritual family, but um, not very religious. Like you said, was it the traditional Mexican family where the men do their thing, the women there to be, you know, you know, stay at the house and clean and stuff like that? Was that how it was around your house? It was not so much stay at the house and clean, but no, we didn't get to go hardly anywhere because they were strict and protective and, uh, you know, fear that something would happen to you. Uh, so the only thing we were allowed to do was participate in this youth group, and uh, and I went with several of my brothers. And it was there that one of the priests asked if we could it was okay to bring a martial arts instructor to teach us some self-defense moves, and, and that's how I started, and then eventually that took me to boxing. Were you a sports kind of girl? Were you athletic at that time? Not at all. I didn't have enough. I didn't think I'd had an athletic boat in my body. I had never done any sports, but um, I guess I, it just came natural to me, and we, I started uh, training in Taekwondo, which was um, the art that was offered at the church, and um, I just felt like it was a natural thing for me to do, and it was something that I could do that was I had access to. But I was prior to that, I was never really athletic. What was school life uh, like for you at the time, growing up, you know, junior high, high school? What was that like for you? Well, I think, like a lot of kids, I mean, it just depends. I was kind of shy, and uh, I know, you know, in junior high school, I, I had a situation where I was jumped by a bunch of high school kids, and after that, you know, that kind of also contributed to me taking this class because my brothers were, you know, that's not going to happen to you again. You're going to learn how to take care of yourself. So one of my brothers you know, took me in the backyard and showed me some moves and um, a few things that would help me, but that also sparked the interest, and, and that's why my mom was was um, in favor of me taking this class. But other than that, it was just average, you know, average junior high school, Haydock Junior High, and uh it was a different time then because <laughs> I'm a lot older. So it wasn't as, um, I, I, I want to say, intense as it is today. The worst thing that could happen is that you got socked. You know, today it's a whole different world out there in terms of, you know, the violence. and. Oh, yes, it is, and especially here in Oxnard. And I know one of your older brothers, uh, Jaime, and I know he he helped out a lot at the uh, La Colonia Boxing back, you know, around the 80s and, so, and stuff. Um, was he the one that, you know, took you out there and, and kind of showed you some moves? Actually, no, Jaime, uh, because when he was doing that, I was traveling the world fighting. Um, it was my other a brother a year older than him. He had just come back from Vietnam, and and, and it was my brother, Arnulfo, who, uh, who was the one that was giving me my lessons. And it's really ironic because decades later, I ended up teaching him, uh, giving him martial arts lessons. Um, but he initially helped me between him and my father. My father was always a big boxing fan. You said you, you were introduced there to martial arts uh, through going to the Catholic school, but do you remember the first time walking in there or, or having to do that? Did it attract you to keep coming back after that? Oh, absolutely. I The first day I started, I took a lesson, and our instructor, Juan Gonzalez, um, was a very hardcore trainer. He was very disciplined. He made us wear army fatigues. Um, he drilled us. He was like a drill sergeant, and I don't know. I just liked the discipline right away. I thought, wow, this is this is really cool. I like the discipline, and 
And I like the fact that finally I was doing something that I could actually be good at because when you're not exposed, you know, and you come from a family where we didn't have really have money to – it wasn't like we were going to take skating lessons or dance lessons. There was nothing for us. Uh, it was, you know, clean the house and do good in school, and, and that was it. So this was the first physical activity I had ever been introduced to that I, I was, it was it came very natural to me. So it just kind of increased my desire to want to learn more. And that class ended, and I was able to convince my mom at that point in time to let me go to a school in the Center Point Mall that was there, a Huarango school. And I continued, I continued training. And then the boxing came eventually when I started uh, fighting um, professionally full contact karate. There just wasn't enough matches for women to compete. So I learned of Benny Urquidez and Lily in L.A. who what they were doing is they were boxing in between. So I thought, well, this is easy. I can just put, keep my feet on the ground and just use my hands. How hard can that be? So I started boxing. Uh, the first time you went into, a, let's say, a boxing ring, or maybe even just the first time you'd spar, even even doing the martial arts thing, the first time you were going to spar with somebody, were you pretty nervous? Were you pretty confident? You know, what was it like the first time you sparred with somebody? You remember, you know, going face to face with somebody? Um, I think I was always a little bit nervous, but there was also that adrenaline, that thrill, that excitement of just being in the ring and and every time you land a solid punch, you know how good it would make you feel to know that you're landing and you're being efficient. Um, but I think from the first time I stepped into the ring to the last time, I always had a little bit of nerves or anxiety of, you know, are you going to get hurt? Um, are you going to do your best? Um, are you going to be able to control the match? Um, so I think that was always there. You said you were you were shy at one time, and now that you're doing boxing and martial arts, did that change your demeanor? Uh, did you become less shy because of it, or did you stay the shy person that you were? No, absolutely. It completely changed me. I was through through training the martial arts and boxing that kind of came out of my shell. I, you know, prior to that, I was really super shy and just not good at communicating with people. Not good. I just never asserted myself. And I think through the boxing, it helped me become more assertive and more confident because if you develop even confidence through a physical means it's going to it's going to affect your your mental and your emotional so because you're confident you realize you're capable of doing something very well well that's going to apply to the other aspects of your life and and that's yeah. so it's kind of that snowball um effect and um so it definitely changed who I was and I started I always say I kind of perceive the eyes you know the world through the eyes of a, a martial artist and to me, boxing is a form of martial art, so I always include it. When you were in there working out, let's say in your first few years, was it naturally, did it come natural to you to, to get good, or did you really have to work hard to, you know, get to that level that you got? I never had to work on it, and I will tell you something, because I received a phone call from Berlin a couple of days ago, um, and it was my one of my boxing trainers, Jimmy Montoya, and I, you know, he, I was talking to him because a lot of our, the fighters that he had at the time that I was competing are gone. You know, they, they're basically they died, um, moved on. And I always recall that when I was at the Olympic boxing gym on Hope Street in L.A., it, it no longer exists. He used to always tell me, "God, Mihai, I wish you were a guy." And I'd say, "Why?" He goes, "Because you hit so hard and you move and you listen and you're trainable." But he knew that as a female, I wasn't going to make the money. I wasn't going to get the fights. And so he always felt bad for me because I was a female. And and I, but I could box like, I mean, like I looked like a guy from a distance. You know, Don King watched me fight once and said, who's that guy? So he got a close-up. I'm not saying I looked like a male, but from a distance, my moves, my actions, uh, my slipping, my bobbing and weaving um, was, was no different. And... Um, so it came very natural to me, and for the size that I was at the time, I could generate quite a bit of power because of the weight. You know, I had a wide, wide back, um, and I just knew how to generate power. So it, it was a natural gift for me, and I always felt like unfortunate, it was unfortunate that I was ahead of my time because it wasn't popular as popular as it has become now, you know, for women boxing. And on, on that, even now, it's hard for women to you know, excel in the sport because there's so many barriers. And obviously, you know, if there's if there's that today, there was a lot more of that, you know, back, you know, when you first do it. 
was it also another barrier that you were Latina at, at the time? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I used to always say that I would have to fight outside of the ring to get into the ring and fight. And what I meant by that was many times um, we were exploited. It was I would be the main event on many shows, but we wouldn't get paid. And then once they found another boxer who was blonde, blue-eyed, they tried to promote her more. And so, and you know, whether it was boxing or kickboxing, they'd match us against each other hoping that she would win. Um, but she never did. I always won. And um, so it was definitely, you have to understand that when I was fighting, you're talking about the 80s, uh, the late 70s, 80s. So it was not popular to be of color. It was not popular to be um, to be Latina. Um, n later on, it changed to, um, you know, women of color so that we were exotic. Um, then it started becoming more popular. But but overall, if you were the blonde, blue-eyed, you received the attention um, and you got the perks and you got the fights and you got the money. So so definitely, it was a different different time in terms of how we were treated based on the color of our skin. And right now, as you were talking, you know, I was thinking of a of a fight picture I saw of you. I think it was either your debut fight or one of your first fights against uh, Karen Bennett. And 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 that fight picture, that fight poster. Uh, of the time, it had uh, Lily Rodriguez, I believe, also fought on the card. And then I started thinking uh, of Blinky Rodriguez, and then they were, I know, in the martial arts, and they were popular back then also. Do you remember them? Did you used to, like, you know, hang out with them? Oh, very that? much. I remember them. Uh, Lily was my mentor. She was the person I mentioned earlier that I found out, hey, she's kickboxing and she's boxing. So that's what gave me the idea to try my hand at boxing. Uh, because um, I really looked up to her. She was a trailblazer. She was a pioneer in the sport, and she was she was incredible as a martial artist, as a boxer, as a kickboxer. And it was like, wow, I want to be like her. Um, and and so that it was you know a very special day. It was July thirteenth, nineteen seventy nine. It was an all women's card, the first one ever at the LA Sports Arena, and there was only women on the card. And Lily was one of the um, uh, the boxers, and um, along with myself. And that was the night. That was my very first fight. And I think what fueled me more than skill was all the racist remarks that Karen was making, and the uh, just just a lot of derogatory comments about you know me being Mexican. So whether I knew how to box or not, I would have probably knocked her out. You know, if I could have. <laughs> Just because of, you know, the anger, and but you had to get a control of that. And she did retire that night and said afterwards, kind of not didn't really apologize, but just said, oh, I thought she was another pretty face. I underestimated her. Yeah, and, I believe uh, she was a nurse or something like that, right? Yeah, she was saying how she was going to tear me up, and then she could put me back together since she was a nurse. Uh, but, you know, that fuels you. You can take that negativity and roll over and die, or you can take it and let it fuel your passion, your you drive whatever it is you want to accomplish, and that's what I chose to do many times. That was just one of many. I think also that night, uh, Lady Tiger fought, and also um, a, a lady by the name, and actually she's one of my uh, Facebook friends. Her name is uh, Cora Weber at that time. Now it's Cora something Weber. different. There and, was uh, Cora, uh, Clara and, and Dora. Cora and Dora Weber. They were twins. Wow, wow, yeah. I remember seeing that, that poster there. And speaking of Blinky Rodriguez, also I posted a... a uh, something on YouTube about Bobby Chacon and Ricky Rodriguez. Was, I believe he, he had something to say about Bobby Chacon on that. He was interviewed on that. Um, the nickname, the goddess, you know, how did you get that? Who gave you that? Um, that name came about through the Herald Examiner dubbed me the goddess, and I never liked it. I never used it, and I tried to do away with it. I just, I don't know. Um, and it was just made good headlines. I fought Ginger Kaufman, who was a drummer, and they say goddess plays taps on drummer girl, and it's that from that day forward, people would label me as the goddess. And also because I wore a long white silk cape, uh, I try to always play up the feminine. I felt that, you know, because I'm a boxer doesn't mean I have to be manly. And if I'm in tune with, you know, my feminine side and I, I, I'm a female, then why can't I look good while I'm fighting? So I would design all my costumes. I, I saw them as costumes because it is entertainment. Part of it is entertainment for the crowd. And not to mention that they did not make boxing trunks for men. I mean, for women, they were made for men, so you can imagine the way they fit women. Um, they were really big and long, and, and it wasn't fashionable in those days to wear long trunks like they're wearing them today. 
Right. Was it hard for you guys to get sanctioned? Like, you know, that card that you guys, that you were talking about with all the women, was it hard for the state to sanction, you know, you guys? Did you guys have to go through loops for that? The state uh, refused to sanction us. In California, my very first fight was in Valley Sports Arena. 31 fights later, I fought at the Forum, and never in between did I fight in California because they would not sanction us for the 10 rounds we needed to defend our title. Now, um, many states, like Arizona, refused to even license women, and then I came out on Us Magazine, and the next month I was brought in as a main event, not getting paid more than 100 bucks a round but the main event. Um, so that was very typical, and I was the first uh, female boxer to fight in the Dominican Republic. I, I mean, it was just common, uh, the first to, to fight in many places because um, they, wouldn't sanction, they wouldn't not only sanction our fights, they wouldn't license us to fight. And, and I don't know that all states do sanction, uh, license women at this point in time. Wow, and you brought up the sports arena where you had your pro debut there. You know, and it's unfortunate they're going to bring it down. It's going to become a, a soccer field in the next few years. And, you know, it's pretty it's pretty sad seeing that, you know, venues like that go. And also you brought up the Olympic gym off of Hope. You know, I remember that gym too. And, you know, it's, it's pretty sad to see those uh, those historical venues go away, you know. Right, right. And, um, yeah, I actually didn't start there. I actually started the Hoover Street Boxing Gym. I don't know if that's still there, but um, that's how hungry I was. I was driving to Hoover Street Boxing Gym because that's where the trainers were at the time. And that trainer, uh, Hap Holloway, uh, introduced me to Jimmy Montoya, who's trained a lot of well-known boxers. And he had Hector Camacho. He had a lot of fighters. And he had the largest probably boxing stable at the time, and he had one female. And so I got to train with these guys. I got to train with Hector Camacho and Jose Gaba and... Um, just a lot of the top, you know, top 10 rated boxers. And I believe to this day that's why I never lost a fight because I had access to top, you know, boxers where a lot of these women did not. Now, you were on, I've seen on boxing records, I only see you having, on their records anyway, I see you having just like a handful of fights, five, six, whatever it might be. And well, But, but I've also read that you had like 30, so, you know, I, I wasn't I've sure. Had, Do you know exactly how many you had? I had 31 fights, 18 knockouts. Zero losses. Now, that is a combined record. Some of those were kickboxing matches, but in boxing I had over 20. I have my records, so do you really do you really think they kept accurate wet, uh, records of women fighters? That's true. That's 30, very true. 31 fights, 18 knockouts, zero losses. And you were the only fighter to simultaneously hold a world women's title and also in the bantamweight and then also a kickboxing world title, right? The WKA, I was the only athlete, female or male, but nobody cared because I was a female. If it was a male who held two worlds, because they're two separate sports. One was kickboxing and one was boxing. And I think last year somebody else did it, but at that time I was the only individual, but it went unnoticed because, I mean, I have to tell you that the best recognition I ever received because it didn't come in the form of monetary compensation. It was from Alex Wallow, who was the president of ABC Sports. And on Wide World of Sports, they did a piece. And at the end, uh, he said he always felt badly for a fighter who he thought was a great mm -hmm. fighter and never had the opportunity to, to really, you know, basically said I was, at, you know, ahead of my time and said my name. And this was, you know, worldwide. And that's probably the most recognition I ever received in terms of, you know, contributions or fighting in the sport of boxing. Wow. And uh, the, as far as the kickboxing part, it, a lot of us just watching kickboxing and boxing, we would figure, all right, the only difference is that in kickboxing you get a kick and use your legs as a weapon. But, you know, is that the only difference or is there a bigger, a bigger difference in, you know, what we uh, see? That's a simple way of looking at it. But can you imagine four weapons coming at you instead of two? Can you imagine? Really, it's more than four because it's your feet, it's your knees, it's, you know. Um, so in a simplistic way, yes, that's the only difference, but it depends on whose rules you're fighting by, whether elbows are allowed. So instead of you're using a boxing glove, but you're also using elbow strikes. So you're expecting a straight cross, and all of a sudden you get nailed with an elbow or a knee, you know, and all the different types of kicks. So it's a little bit more complex, but... But, yeah, if you could look at it, I would say, and that's the way I looked at it initially, I just have to keep my feet on the ground to box. Kickboxing is much harder to me. Kickboxing is much harder than boxing, more complicated. 
but boxing is more dangerous in my opinion because boxing the range is different and if you go based on range kickboxing you could stay in an outside range and and not get hurt as much in boxing you're either going toe to toe or you're moving you're within an intermediate range or going to the body so you're going to sustain more injuries in boxing than most likely in kickboxing well, that's information I couldn't get from a boxer there. It's, you know the difference between those two, and you obviously you know the, know the difference of those two. Does having shoes on in, in, in boxing and you know having you know being barefoot in, in, in kickboxing, does that is there a difference in, in movement and does it affect your speed or movement or any of that? Of course, it, well, of course it does because it, depending on boxing shoes, you're getting more traction and to be able to push off and generate more power. Um, and it and it just also depends on the cam if it's a canvas you know what ring and what you're fighting in. But even most kickboxers now, I mean, we still wore a little um, it's kind of like an ankle bracelet or set, uh, a brace that goes around your ankle, so it does kind of compress your joints. But uh, but if you think about the same thing with hand wraps, what do hand wraps really do? They're compressing your joints. I mean, it's not so much to protect you, but they are in case, you know, originally they were designed to, co to protect your hand from further injury if you broke something because it kept it, as a, it compressed. So there is a, a definite difference. I think I think you're at a, an advantage when you're using, when you have like boxing uh, boots on because you can push off, you can move, you can shuffle. A little bit easier, um, you're sweating and you don't have uh, boxing um shoes on you can slip easier so just things to think about do you think it's important for women to know self-defense or know some kind of self-defense in today's world you know with all these sexual assaults and all these you know bad people that are out there you think it's it, it's good for them to learn some kind of you know technique and somehow to defend themselves first of all i want to say that it's kind of it's sad that the question needs to be asked but i will respond to it Absolutely. I think that no different than we're educated that we learn how to read and we learn how to write and we learn how to do math. We should learn how to take care of our own bodies and protect them. And it's so neglected when we think about it. In this lifetime, the body that you're in is the only body you're getting. And if you don't know how to take care of it, and I'm not talking about, you know, um, knowing how to eat properly and take care of yourself, but protect it from a, from a violent attack, then where will you be? So I think that it should be part of, it should be no different than learning how to brush your teeth. You should be able to take care of yourself. You should be able to protect yourself. You should at least have um, have the opportunity to learn something that will increase your chances of surviving in an assault situation. And I think it's sad that women think that, okay, I went to a workshop uh, three years ago. I'm good. I'm good to go. I know. I went to a workshop. They don't. They fail to realize that it's a physical skill. So just like learning how to dance or skateboard, or play pool or do anything else, it takes repetition and it takes time investment. And we'll invest a lot of time learning how to do salsa moves, but we will invest very little time learning how to protect the body that's doing the salsa moves. If you know what I mean. So I think it's very important. And by the way, you know I do have a martial arts school, 940 South A Street. Casillas Martial Arts, and we offer classes, combat, you know, combat fitness, uh, a couple of nights a week. You know, it's a good workout, but it's preparing your body for combat, for the fight, because learning how to defend yourself is not enough if your body is not prepared to sustain, you know, the the trauma. Somebody punches at you, are you going to roll over and die, or are you going to be able to fight back because you're strong enough to fight back? So that's a topic that I could talk on for hours. So I'll just say that yes, I really think that it's important that little girls learn how to defend themselves and little boys because little boys get bullied as much as little girls get assaulted. So I think it should be part of everybody's tool bag to know what to do. And as a grown-ups, you should know because even if you think you're tough enough, you're a boxing world champion, and now you're retired, you can handle yourself well, what are you going to do when you walk out from a restaurant with your wife or your child and somebody comes up to you with a knife or a gun? Can you protect yourself and protect them in the process? So a lot of questions to ask, and all of that requires training and an awareness that none of us are invincible. There's always somebody stronger. There's always somebody smarter, and there's always somebody somebody that has more skill than you may have. So I think training is important, and everybody should do it. And I was going to ask you for a message to give out to all those uh, women that are thinking of, you know, get, getting into sport, getting into some kind of self-defense class, or doing any kind of combat sport at all. 
you know, I was going to ask you to give a message to them, but I think you just answered that. Great. Uh, yeah, Rachella, but, thank you very much. I will, add, yes. I will add one thing to that, and, and that's for them to be careful because be careful who your trainer is, be careful who your manager is, pay attention because you can get used, you can be thrown to, you know, to the wolves. Make sure that whoever you're working with is looking out for your best interest and make sure that he really knows what he's doing because the cage is very different from the boxing ring that I was in or the kickboxing ring. Uh, you're using, you know, almost no gloves and the damage is a lot more severe and, you know, the consequences are a lot more severe. So, you know, make sure you're, you're in the ring for the right reason and it shouldn't just be for a big payday um, because what's the point of making a lot of money if you can't enjoy it? Oh, that well, would be my message to young ladies contemplating becoming a fighter in any arena. Well, you're a real pioneer, Graciela, and I thank you very much. I feel very honored to be uh, talking to you and finally get to talk to you and get to know about you and everything you've accomplished and done. I thank you very much for coming on to theboxingbar.com, and thank you. Uh, maybe uh, one, one day you'll be able to come back on and let us know a little bit more about uh, your days in boxing. Anytime. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you.